Hello again, you sick, twisted weather freaks. Welcome to another fun-filled, action-packed, and intellectually stimulating edition of This Week in Weather. I'm your host and meteorologist, DT, from Weather Risk here in Central Virginia, your commander of chaos, colonel confusion, your captain of catastrophe. Let's talk about Ian on this special edition of This Week in Weather. A lot to talk about, so let's get right to it. First, we'll start taking a look, I guess, at the satellite picture. And uh, here you can see uh, two infrared pictures here. The first one is from 2135Z, which is uh, 5.30 this afternoon. And you can see a really big ball of intense convection right there in the center of it. It looked like it's getting organized. And then this evening, it kind of looks like it's falling apart a little bit. I mean, you can clearly see, call it my arrow here, here's the big convection here, and look what happens. It's like completely gone. Now, the but that's not necessarily true because what we're seeing is a lot more curvature here in the cloud band. So you can see the curvature here and the curvature here wrapping into the center. So we may be getting a better organized lower level center here. One of the problems we've had with the hurricane models today is that there is a couple of different elongated centers in this uh, tropical storm. So it, it, it's, it's been hard for the models to figure out which center is going to be the right one. As the system gets better organized, however, I think we're going to see more of that um, <clears throat> and see more a better uh, model um, resolution of this dilemma, whether or not it's going to hit <clears throat> southwest Florida, western Florida, the Florida panel, or what have you. Now, this here is our visible infrared pictures, and you can see, uh, excuse me, the short wave overnight, and you can see again, uh, this is a close-up shot here of, um, you can see how we're getting a lot more curvature wrapping into the center here, and these band here, and the band here, all wrapping into the center, and that's what it looks like on the big picture here in the uh, Central Caribbean. So I think it's getting better organized, but so far, the recon's not finding a lot of organization here. So, um, you know, but on the other hand, if you look at the model data, they're really going crazy here with the intensification. They clearly bring it up to category three or four status, most of the models. And uh, I don't see any reason to go against that. I think the environment here, as it usually is this time of year, in the Northwest Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, is ideal. And uh, I think that's where it's going to really bomb out here. So we'll see. Now, earlier today, I'm sure many of you already saw or heard the operational 12Z GFS and the hurricane models and the GFS ensembles all shifted to the west. Now, remember that all the hurricane models that you see here on the left they're all um, run off the GFS grid. So if the GFS shifts west, almost all of these models are going to shift as well, west as well. So what happens here is that it looks like southwest Florida is in the clear because it seems as if, let me call it up here, you can see it again, that um, you see the western tip of Florida. Many of these models have it just hitting the west tip of Florida or actually going to the Gulf, uh, the Yucatan Channel. And then what that does is that means it takes a wider loop. You see, by coming up and swinging west, very across the far western tip of Cuba, it swings wider and ends up hitting either north of Tampa in the Big Bend area. And you can see many of the ensembles, including the operational one, takes it to Pensacola. That the black line here is the Pensacola. And you can see that. Uh, and then you can see the spaghetti diagram, the spaghetti plots on either side of that. But the hurricane models are not quite that far west, but the, the GFS the ensembles were. Um, I think this is nonsense. Uh, this might be okay, but I think this is bullshit. So we'll see. Okay. Um, now, what the key issue here to this whole thing is the monster trough, which is coming in here on Sunday night and Monday. Now, this is what the pattern is going to look like on Tuesday, September 27th. You see the black line I drew there across Mississippi, Alabama, northern Georgia? That is the base of the trough. And you can see Ian there approaching the western tip of Cuba. So the question is, is how deep is the trough and does the trough grab Ian and capture it? It can grab Ian and pull it north, which is what the GFS is showing, but then the trough swings on by and the Ian is left heading due north into the Florida panhandle. It does not turn to the northeast. The European does have a turn to the northeast. Let me show you what I mean. So here's the GFS. Now, if we look at this, this is almost, this is almost identical, okay? Uh, the main difference is that where you can see that um, if we blow this up a little bit here, you can see that uh, it has Ian further off the west coast of Cuba. See that? That little jog to the west impacts how much, of the, how much the trough grabs it, how much it pulls it northward. Let me show you what I mean. So again, here's the European. You see where it is 
western tip of Cuba, here is the GFS, what, on the, almost in the Yucatan Channel. So that's a big difference. Now, this cold front means business. This is a big cold front coming through here, another big one here. I don't know if it's a sign for the autumn and the cold season, but here's the front that comes through a Sunday afternoon. Uh, low pressure in the eastern Great Lakes, a front across western New York State, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee. The big high coming down here, uh, right here, you can see it. Let me call it my arrow. You can see it here for a second. Uh, we know we don't want that. Uh, where'd the arrow go? Oh, I lost it. Anyway, um, so that's what it's, what it's doing. There it is. Okay. And you can see, here's the big high um, right here. You can see it right there. And there's the cold front right through here in the low pressure area. Now, you can't yet see Ian on that side of the map. You can't see it. It hasn't showed up there yet, but it will. And then if we go to the next image, here's the European. Now, the front is now off the coast uh, Monday afternoon. And then you can see Ian just appearing at the bottom of the map. And there's our low pressure area in the eastern Great Lakes. It's a cold, cold, windy day in the eastern Great Lakes area. And then when we get to here, we can see the European. This is now for Wednesday morning. Now, <clears throat> the European has it at the 12Z run. This is 18 run, I should say. 970. Some of the models have it 950, 945 on the European. Uh, but look at the high here. You can see this is uh, 1035 millibars. And look at these north winds really coming down the cold air. And that really going to, you're going to see those winds like we saw the other day up and down the east coast, but especially from Pennsylvania through Virginia down through North Georgia and, and Alabama, Mississippi. It's going to pull down a lot of cold air for this time of year. Look at these temperatures. Uh, this is a Wednesday morning. Look at Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa. That is a killing frost for this time of year before October. That's a big killing frost. That's much colder the models had it a couple of days ago. But even we're in the mid 30s in West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, Central Illinois. And now the, the cold air is just getting into Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. But this is going to be a lot of dry air. And this dry air is going to be situated across the deep south as Ian approaches Florida. And that's going to be a problem. It's going to cause rapid weakening, this cold air. And now once the cold air gets east of the Appalachians, you're going to see the temperatures drop. Here's the next day. This is the morning of September 29th. And you can see, again, another frost likely in most of the Great Lakes in the Ohio Valley, West Virginia, uh, portions of the mountains of Pennsylvania, New York State, and central and northern New England. This is going to be another frost. you got 40s in Tennessee. Hurricane approaching, you have 40s in Tennessee. You don't see that every day. You have upper 40s in northern Alabama with a hurricane approaching. Keep that in mind, folks. This is a big deal. Okay, now let me show you what I mean. Here in the, we have two images which show you what happens now on Wednesday afternoon. The one in the upper left, this here is the European, okay? You see where the trough is, and, and, and uh, Ian, there it is, near approaching the central Florida coast. But here on the GFS, it's well off the coast, and as a result, you can see the trough axis is right here. It's bypassing it. You see how it's northeast of it? Here, almost due north. So as a result, this trough on the European grabs in and pulls it northeast into Florida and Georgia. Here, the GFS in the lower left, it bypasses it. The trough axis is here along 75 degrees longitude, and that is too, 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 that is too far to the east that Ian gets left behind. So now that's important because here's what happens. Here is the, eight, the 12Z GFS. You can see it. Now, the brown represents really, really dry air, and the green is very, very moist air. So we have a Category 5 hurricane, almost a Category 5 hurricane, the central Gulf of Mexico, headed towards the Florida Panhandle in Mississippi. But look at the dry air just to the north. As soon as you go inland, you have tons of dry air. So the dry air gets pulled into the system. It begins to wrap into the, We can already see the dry air getting wrapped into the system here. See that? See how it gets pulled in the system? Remember, a hurricane is a huge circulation. So as it approaches the coast, it's going to grab this dry air and pull it in. There's no doubt about that. So then what happens is the, um, the hurricane models take it um, uh, right through the channel. Well, this is the, the global models here. From, and you can, again, you can see all these models take it almost to the Yucatan Channel. Now, I just think this is too far west. I just think this is way too far west. Okay, so then, uh, but we can see some change here a little bit. Here's the 18Z hurricane models. Again, you can see most of them are north of Tampa in the Big Bend area over Apalachicola, Pensacola. But at the end, the 0Z run, you can see right here, the uh, models bend back to the right. 
You see how they bend a little bit right here at the end? Notice again, here, here's Apalachicola, and then here is the zero zero. See, they bend it to the right a little bit at the end. So it's not much of a change, it's a slight change. So we'll see. Now, the European is vastly different. The European, you can see it goes over Western Cuba, and then it heads towards Tampa. Very, very uh, clearly heading towards Tampa. And then the uh, European has a 948 right before it hits Tampa. This is a direct hit in Tampa, St. Petersburg. This would be a disaster. If this is right, this is a disaster. This would be the worst hurricane in over 150 years in Tampa. And you would flood the entire bay with massive amounts of storm surge being channeled up into this bay. This hurricane planners, hurricane disaster planners have been worried about this scenario forever. This is as bad as the one in New Orleans with Katrina. This would be a catastrophe if this is right. And what's even worse is that look at the winds on the European. 123 miles an hour. Okay, over 100 miles an hour up and down the entire uh, west central coast, Tampa, St. Petersburg. And if, in fact, if you look at the data, it has winds over 65 miles an hour for about 20 hours. All out of the east southeast, blowing that water straight into the bay. This would be really, really bad news for Tampa if this happens. I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying it's a disaster for Tampa if it happens. Okay. <coughs> The other difference is that if this scenario is right, it pulls in a lot less dry air because it comes in over the west coast of Florida. If, it's, on the other hand, the GFS is right and it hits up here, like I said before, if it hits up in this area, you're going to pull in the dry air. So the finally, here is the, um, you can see the 18C GFS, look what happens. You can see how, the, how it collapses completely, 931 to 966 in the space of uh, six hours. Or no, excuse me, that's a little more than a day, so that's not the quite that fast. But you can see it really weakens over the next day, from Wednesday to uh, Wednesday afternoon, and Wednesday evening until early Friday morning, about 30 or 36 hours, something like that. And you can see it really weakens dramatically because it pulls in all that air. So it, it's going to be a problem. And then finally, now again, what happens if the European scenario is correct? You can see it goes to Florida, then to Georgia. Look at this gargantuan high here over the Great Lakes, very strong. And then um, it moves into Georgia very slowly. You get a big, big rain shield here in the southeastern states. And eventually, the pushes into Georgia. You get rain into Ohio, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, Delaware, West Virginia. A lot of rain here, a lot of flooding, potentially heavy rains in the mountains. Um, <clears throat> and the 18Z GFS is doing the same sort of thing. Now, it's further west, but there's a lot of rain up and down uh, the, the southeastern states into Virginia and the Appalachian Mountains and southern areas as well. So we'll see. So again, the real scenario is if it goes towards west central Florida, it doesn't weaken as fast. If it goes straight into the Florida panhandle, it's going to suck in all that dry air and it's going to collapse big time as it approaches the Appalachicola, Pensacola, Florida panhandle area. There you go. That's what I think right now. We'll see what happens so it looks like tomorrow. This is DT from Weather Risk. I'll see you over on the Twitter page and over on the website and on the Facebook page.